الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي انزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاه والسلام على خير خلقي ونور عرش افضل الانبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين اما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو اصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انما المؤمنين المؤمنون الذين اذا ذكر الله وجلت قلوبهم واذا تليت عليهم ايات زادتهم ايمانا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد واهل محمد <تصفيق> I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful, and all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this life and making us who we are and blessing us with this month of Ramadan in which much mercy has descended upon us and for the human race. It is the month in which the Quran was revealed. It is the month in which Allah has prescribed upon us fasting so that we can improve in our abilities to fight off the evil inclinations in order for us to elevate our standards and st- and ourselves for this world and the next world. And Allah has created us with two major components, the material component and the spiritual component. It's very important for us to know that these two components coexist within us. And it is very important that we do not deprive either one of its um, due. There are those who become very spiritual and they give up their material pursuits. And then there are those who are very material and they give up their spiritual pursuits. Both are actually wrong. That is not what Allah has created us for. When we hear the story that we should be self-annihilating, you know, we hear this fana of the self in order to merge with Allah. These metaphorical conversations need to be clarified, otherwise people will misunderstand them. Self-annihilation is not totality of self-annihilation. It is the annihilation of the evil inclinations that should be annihilated, not the good one. Our material desires should be nurtured and we should go after them. Allah says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِي وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ Who has made the good things of this world haram for you? Allah says they are for you in this world. And they are exclusively for the believers in the next world. So Allah has not forbidden that. So we must, when we discuss in these important nights, how do we balance? Because the religion of Islam, if there is one word besides the very profound words that should come to the front of our thoughts and our t- tongues, when we're asked, what is Islam? Okay, in the simplest of ways, when someone says, what is Islam? The, the word itself should be sufficient. It's, it invokes the principal word called peace. Salam. You will find nothing resonates better with our hearts and the human race, even on the social front, even if you're running for politics. The word peace is the most attractive word. It causes people to imagine it, it causes people to support such individuals. And we're all looking for peace. Not only social, political peace, but internal peace. The one that gives me tranquility. We call it tranquility, sukoon. You see, Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِيمَانًا he it is who sends tranquility into the hearts of believers. And he increases their faith upon their faith. So imagine this verse, the last part. Implies that you and I can claim to be believers. We can claim that we have faith. But the Qur'an is saying that there is an evolution, a growth in faith. Imanam ma'imanihim. 
Meaning, even if you have faith, there's always room to gain more faith. It's very important on that, to understand. But in summary, we have material and spiritual. We must teach ourselves and our children and our generations that both are critical and important and they should not be neglected. Our desire to become wealthy, our desire to live in good homes and have fine cars and fine clothes and to be sophisticated and to use advanced technologies is not forbidden in Islam. It is encouraged. Today, the advancements of what we have Look at our cars today. They've become much more sophisticated than they ever were. If you look at the early times when Ford engineered the car, those cars were very dangerous to drive on the road. They had very minimal safety measures. Today, cars are designed to also auto-drive. They're still perfecting that art. But if the desire for those things did not exist, if there was no economy for that, if there were no people demanding such technologies, then we would be inhibiting progress materially. So to, to want sophisticated things and to want entities that the average doesn't have is not forbidden in Islam. And Allah proves that to us through his prophet, Sulaiman. You notice Sulaiman in his period of time was so wealthy and so advanced in his technology that he rivaled all societies. Now he's a prophet of Allah and Allah reveres him in the Quran. Allah blesses Sulaiman with much honor in the Quran. And Allah says we gave him much wealth and much power to the extent that when he invites the queen of Sheba, she was stunned by his palace. The floor of his palace was made of glass. Even in today's world, you don't have homes with glass floors generally. They're very expensive to build. But Suleiman had it. Suleiman had surveillance systems more sophisticated than the drones that we have today. His surveillance was a living creature, a bird, who could fly and not only go see something in distant land, but come back and tell him what they were doing wrong. Which drone today can do that? Which drone can come and tell you that they are obeying Allah and disobeying Allah? Hudhud, who was the bird of Suleiman, would come back and tell Suleiman that there's a queen who's worshipping the sun. He was more advanced than we are today. So such advancements are not forbidden in Islam. It's the negative advancements that we must be careful about. It's the ones that can cause destruction within our societies that we need to be vigilant about and to say, no, we will not allow such advancements because ethically they will violate the principal notion of peace. Peace. So when someone asks us, what is Islam? Tell them it's peace. It's submission to the Almighty. But another word you and I should use, it's balance. Islam is a religion of balance. When someone asks you, what is Islam? In the function of peace, is that you can't have peace unless you have balance. When you have extremism, you lack peace. If you look at the physics of the universe, you will notice it's constantly moving towards a balance. Everything in chemistry is trying to balance itself. In physics, it's balancing itself. When we look within our body and you have free radicals in your body, it's destructive. Free radicals are a result of, you know, um, atoms that are loosely destroying our bodies. So we take antioxidants in order to neutralize free radicals so that there's a balance in the body. When we eat, there should be a balance. Excessive eating is dangerous. Allah in the Quran says, Kulu, washrabu, wa la tusrifu. Innahu la yuhibbul musrifeen. Eat, drink, don't overdo it. He doesn't like it when you overdo it. It's harmful to you. So when we say, what should I indulge in this world? Allah says, everything that is halal for you, but don't overdo it. It's harmful to you because the physics of the universe demands balance. And if you create an imbalance, it will come back and throw you off, you know, off your extremism and it will force a balance. The law of nature. Allah is merciful. Allah in the Quran in Surah Rahman says, Surah Rahman, وَعَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْتِ 
ولا تخسروا الميزان maintain the balance and don't tip the balance Allah says we made the universe in balance maintaining balance justice تواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر تواصل بالحق maintain justice maintain truthfulness maintain balance you will find the most powerful principles of Islam is built on the principles of balance our children when they come and ask us to do something and we know it's not good for them. Don't just say no to them. Say no with another option. Give them an alternative when you say no. The child, when they are told no, it's extremism in their head. You are extreme, they say. And that's right. That perception appears to be extreme. It's prohibitive. Sadly, I question a lot of youth around the world and they consider Islam rather than it being peace, submission, balance, they see it as prohibitive, inhibitive, too much haram. Everything is forbidden in Islam. My friends can do so much. They think that way. And then of course they are very afraid. They have to pray. As mom and dad told them, if you don't pray, you're going to hell. We are masters of defining and constantly talking about hell. We're experts of hell. The minute somebody does something, you're going to hell. And we're so good, go to hell. I don't like you, go to hell. Alhamdulillah, Allah is Maliki Yawmiddin, otherwise we would all be going to hell because we'd be sending each other to hell. Oh, that sister's not wearing hijab. Oh, she's going to hell. She's going to be dragged by her hair. Who said that? Who told you that? Allah has prescribed modesty. And we'll talk about hijab. And modesty is not only for women. It's for men too. Allah says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ You know, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَلَا يُدْنِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ Allah is talking about a balance. Let the men lower their eyes and women also lower their eyes and cover yourselves properly so that there's no indecency because it's a religion of balance. But when our children and our adults consider a religion to be inhibitive slash prohibitive, then the love of that religion diminishes. For we start to think less of it and we consider the religion to become a burden upon us. When in fact, religion of Allah is designed to remove the burden. You see? So we have to be cognizant that even when we are fasting in the month of Ramadan, it's not a burden upon us. It's a system of Allah to help us to balance ourselves. So when we say no to our children, give them an option. Say, Habibi or Janan, <laughs> don't do this. How about we do that? Oh, okay. It's not prohibitive. There's an alternative. Allah is describing this essence of peace even in paradise. Allah says, لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا تأثيما إلا قيلا سلاما سلاما In paradise, you won't hear vain talk. No extremism, gossip, fault finding are extreme behaviors. When we cause fitna with each other, when we fight, when we fault find, when we cause destruction within our families and societies, you find that that's extremism. It leads to displeasure. It leads to uh, pain. It leads to a lot of stress, which leads to death. But Allah says in paradise, you won't hear vain talk, fault finding, none of that rubbish. Except everyone will be saying, peace, peace. Salaman, salama. So when we talk about how do we achieve this peace, not only within ourselves the most, because I believe the greatest conversation is how do I achieve internal peace? Very important. And we are trying, we're experimenting. And as I mentioned, the stages of the evolution of the cell, the nafs, how do we reach that stage that after when we have found ourselves to be the problem and we have found ourselves therefore to be the solution 
How do I reach that stage where I'm satisfied with myself, with tranquility, ever eager to return to my Lord? As Allah says, In za'amtu mannakum, ya ayu alladhina hadu, qul ya ayu alladhina hadu, in za'amtum annakum awliyahu lillahi min duni nas, fatamannaw al-mawt in kuntum sadiqeen. You claim to be chosen people of God, then have a desire to return to me. Here, Allah is not talking about suicide, not talking about death. Fatamannaul mawt means, mawt here means return to Allah. You mean you're eager to come to Him. Fatamannaul mawt. How do you reach that stage where the petty things of the world don't bother you? You think of the long term. You are seeing yourself on judgment day. The promise you made to that individual, whether you borrowed money or you made a promise to help them, you are looking at the day of judgment when you make that promise. We need to teach our children the way to balance, by the way, the key component of causing the ship to be balanced in the sea is to peg itself to long-term thinking. When you and I have long-term thinking and when our children are taught to think long term, they become balanced. The reason children become very agitated, they're very impatient, they lack the desire to wait till tomorrow. It's very typical, children have that. It's because they are develop they've developed short term thinking because they're in survival mode. They want to survive now. Now I need this pleasure now. But you say to them, hold on, You'll get this pleasure tomorrow, but better. They said, no. That lack of long-term thinking ends up becoming adulthood. And you'll find adults who are unafraid of dying and they're still cheating and lying. And while they bear allegiance that there is a day of judgment, they don't really believe in it because they haven't taken the long-term into consideration. As a result, agitation starts. You will notice people who have long-term will not cheat you generally. They won't cheat you. And when I'm talking about long term, I'm talking about eternity. Because as they say in wisdom, okay, wise people think long term. Foolish people think short term. Now the wise person who thinks long term already has the short term in it. But the foolish one has no long term in it. So long term thinking is superior. You'll find Quran constantly reminds us of that. Be aware of Yawmul Qiyam. And of the Day of Judgment, they have certainty. The God-conscious ones. In fact, when you look at all the verses where Allah reveres and praises people, the Ahlul Bayt, particularly in the Prophets, you'll find that they talk in long term. Look, I'll give you one example. Allah says, وَيُتْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا Allah is talking about Ahlul Bayt. As you know, Fatima al-Zahra, salamullahi alayha, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You find that they may, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein were not well, so she vowed that she will fast for three days uh, as her promise to God that they should be recovered. It's a nadar. So as you know, as she's about to break the fast, you know, miskino, the poor man comes first, then of course uh, an orphan comes, and then a wayfarer, a stranger from another town. And each time she, they're ready to break their fast, they hear knock on the door, and they give their food away. And they break their fast with meager leftovers. And they break their fast the second day. The power of sacrifice. You will notice without long term, you can't sacrifice. You will not let go of something. If you believe in long term, you will let go easily. When Allah says, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ They spend with what we give them, it's because they have long term in their vision. They know they will not be bankrupt. They know Allah gave them this, and they know Allah will give them more. So you find the house of Ahlul Bayt is giving this food, and Allah is so pleased with them. يُوفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ Listen to the verse. They keep their promises 
and they are afraid of that day. Yufuna bin Nadri wa yakhafuna yawman kana sharruhu mustatira. Meaning they are afraid of that long day, the day when the day of judgment will come. They have it in their context constantly, hence their behavior is the way it is. And then Allah says, This is in Surah Al-Dahr, by the way, Surah Insan. Then Allah shows us what they actually say. Because well, now Allah is talking about them. Now Allah is telling me what do they say. They say, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. We want no reward from you, not even thanks. Wow, you just gave us food. You fed us. We knocked on your door. You didn't slam the door on our faces. You gave us the food that was meager for you, and you shared it for us. They said, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. You know why they say that? You know what is the essence of why they say that? Because they feel they haven't done enough for Allah. They feel Allah has done too much for them. They feel even if they gave their souls to Allah, they will not pay them back. This is why they say, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا إنا نخاف من ربنا يوما عبوسا قمطريرا We are afraid of that day when hearts will be palpitating. What will we answer our God when he has been so kind and generous and merciful to us that when we give, we should not give for thanks or for reward. We've already been rewarded. Subhanallah, it's quintessential. When we talk about essence of gratitude, when you talk about an individual who has understood the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's such people. To that level that they have accounted for Allah's mercy to such levels that they say nothing in this world will change us from appreciation of how merciful Allah is. Imam Hussain alayhi salam in Karbala, as his child has received an arrow by Hurmala, and he's seeing the blood dripping, and this child has lost its soul, he looks up and says, Ridam bi qada wa tasliman bi amri. We're satisfied by your decree, Allah. But your child just got killed. And guess what? You are the Imam. You are the Prince on earth. You are the leader of all of mankind on earth. And you answer this way? They said, yeah. Because we are too grateful to Allah. We are balanced. We are peaceful. We have too much tranquility. That while we see the misbehavior of the societies, we have been sent as guidance to you. So that we teach you how to behave. Believe me, brothers and sisters, travel the world, study religions on earth. There are thousands of them, major ones, few dozen. Study them. You will find nothing in any historical equation to what I just mentioned. In historical equations, you will never find personalities of this character, but the ones that we have in the deen of Allah in Islam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah says to us, how do you reach this? So we have problems today. I'm going to touch on a few today before I end. But let me point out. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ The believers are those. إِذَا ذُكِّرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ When they hear God's name or they recognize God's presence, their hearts become pliant. Meaning, you, you, feel, cool, you feel good. Like I've seen it, by the way, even among, of course, non-Muslims too. Sometimes I would sit with non-Muslim audience in the university and I'd talk about God and they would all look at me. Tell us more. Tell us, who is this God? We want to know. And then they are spin drop silence. And they are eager to hear the nuances of the definition of this ever-present, ubiquitous God. And I look at them and they have no distraction. Eager. Because... Heart is palpitating for God. It's not Muslim. There are Muslims, sadly, you talk to them about Allah, they yawn and they fall asleep. You gossip and they're wide awake. You find false, oh, wide awake. They were sleepy, they lost it. But talk about God, they fall asleep. Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَ سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى 
ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصل النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا remind them reminding is beneficial the one whose heart is pliant doesn't have to be Muslim in name one who is conscious of God's presence will listen to you سيذكر من يخشى but the one who is hard hearted the one who is material selfish short term visioned individual material capricious as we say in english one who is very selfish self centered only me me i'll destroy the world machiavellian style and let me take it for me allah says wa yatajannabu al ashqa the one whose ears are heavy they will not hear you hmm? allah says wa idha tutla alayhi ayatuna walla mustakbiran kan lam yasma'ha kan fi udunayhi waqra when you recite the verses to them they turn away like they haven't heard you like there is a heaviness in their ears quran states it unbelievably elegantly he says but what is the problem he says well remind them it's essential for them to recognize allah says inna al mu'minuna alladhina idha dhukira allah wajilat qulubuhum you and i should pray in this month of ramadan ya allah that give me that cognizance that when you are mentioned in any gathering that i should be vigilant and i should be cognizant and focused in that and let me not be reckless and fidgety and material that i need to pop pills in my mouth all the time because i am so depressed or i'm so hypertensed i've got so much stress i need all kinds of chemicals to calm me down today we are swimming in chemicals we are swimming the drug industries are making trillions of dollars and playing with the human psyche and we are throwing all kinds of drugs at each other and we are so dissatisfied because we've ignored our spirituality that now we are imbibing in all kinds of fantasy drugs today there is this drug called fentanyl they say there is a just one car load of fentanyl that crossed the border of canada to the united states they say it is more lethal than all the nuclear power on earth and then there's another drug that has come out called car fentanyl it's much deadlier than that and i'm thinking there's a market for this people are lining up to buy these things and those labs are manufacturing these kinds of drugs that are so deadly they give you this fantasy for a moment and the next thing you are dead you're overdosed and dead and i'm thinking why is our society going in that direction honestly deep down it's the net result of having denied the essential nature of the spirit when it is denied it leads into apathy it leads into a vacuum spiritual vacuum where the individual feels lonely they feel depressed and as a result they need solutions and today the drug industry is ever ready to throw pills at us and once we get addicted we're done i know with sadness some physicians with due respect to physicians who are masters of causing people to become uh addicted they'll give you this you know vicodin and painkillers because they make money and then you keep coming back for that and rather than get cured you got addicted it's a it's an ugly industry with all due respect to physicians there are good ones and there are bad ones and i ask the question why is that happening we don't have such dialogues we hardly talk and i want to introduce today the i gen you know what the i gen is the i generation that's this group the one that was born in 1995 to 2012 that's the new generation these are the ones who are completely born with these instruments i have seen even in my lectures some of you come and you've got your phone with you you know you look like you're really reflecting <laughs> but you're chatting You know how much research has come out lately that children are developing bipolar correct characteristics it's leading to an increased amount of depression 
Suicide rates have increased. Loneliness. You would think this child is talking to a million people at a time, potentially on Twitter, and they're lonely, and they're depressed and suicidal. If you see pictures, I've seen it. I watch when parents bring their children at school. Mommy's on the phone. The child is on the phone. Somebody else is on the phone. The kid gets out of the car. Mom is still on the phone. Slams the door. Mom is still on the phone. She zooms away. Never like hug, you know. Assalamu alaikum. Take care. And then our modern cars today. Plug-ins. Every seat has a plug. You got your separate video streams, your audio streams. The child gets into the car. Father goes to pick up the child from school. Child gets into the car. He's got his headphones. Plug it in. Goodbye. I'm in my cyber world. We're giving each other cyber hugs, cyber love, sending hearts to each other, LOLs, you know, all kinds of, and the, by the way, now the emoticons, that's just one dimensional. Micho Kaku says that there's going to come a time soon because research has shown we're able to upload emotions into a human brain now, you know that. We have successfully uploaded emotions into an existing living human brain. He says soon there will come a time when we will not be sending such emoticons. We will be sending emotions to each other. Like when you're happy, I'll feel your happiness in actual emotion in my brain. That's the world we're approaching. So what's the answer to this? You find children are constantly, I've seen parents talk to their children on a dining table texting. Texting. I'm sitting on the dining table. They're both on the phone. I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm talking to my son. I said, he's right there. <laughs> Since he doesn't talk to me. We only talk by text. That's sad. Very sad. Research has shown that this addiction, by the way, the iGen population almost entirely has this phone in their hands. Now, is it bad? No, it's not bad. Research shows if you use a screen, a phone, or a screen for less than two hours, maximum, meaning anything less than two hours, it's not unhealthy for you. Anything more than that in a day leads to depression, leads to unhappiness, leads to sadness, and leads to a disconnection socially. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do jama'ah. I'll talk about salah. إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَلَذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرِ Salah. I'll talk about it some, the other nights. Prayer. Why is prayer so important? Especially jama'ah. Shoulder to shoulder. You have to put your phone away. Some people, sadly, they leave it on so they can watch the text as they're praying. I've seen people in Hajj. Shalone. Salaamu Alaikum. Labbaik. Allahumma Allah. He's got a phone on the head. I say, you're doing tawaf. Labbaik. Allahumma Labbaik. Labbaik. Allah. They've got a phone. Hello. I said, La hawla wa la quwwata. And then, of course, we've reached beyond that, of course. We've lost our connection with society. I've seen kids who don't even know how to shake hands, don't even know how to give you eye contact. They don't even know how to communicate with you. But chattery online, very antisocial in the real world. It's a problem. Today, our children hardly go to parks. Parks have disappeared. You know that there was a time kids used to line up when they were 16. They used to line up to go get their license. I remember when I turned 16, on my birthday, I got my license. Right? This generation doesn't care about license. They hardly go out. They don't need it. Either call an Uber. <laughs> don't go out. They've done research to show that children hardly go out with their parents lately. They hardly communicate with society. They're online constantly chatting. And they, have be they become sedentary where their le levels of activity is minimized and they are developing type 2 diabetes because they are now getting overweight. And you've got all kinds of problems. So socially they're becoming apt. So I advise us all, zikr of Allah is balance. As parents, we should be vigilant to make sure, take them away. In our school, we ask the students, how many of you are willing to volunteer to give us your phones? And some says, okay, we'll try it. Within 30 minutes after they handed over, they came knocking at the door. Can, can, can we get it back? Can we get it back? He says, that's an addiction. You have an addiction. Back off. Back off. What is it? You're making life 
you know, uh, threatening decisions that you need the phone? Are you like a surgeon who's now taking care of a very sick patient that you need to answer something? No, these are our children. But they need to see how many likes they got, how many followers do they have. It's an addiction. And it's not only for kids. Adults, successful Hollywood adults are dying online looking for accolades and looking for how many followers they have so that they can get the return. They are also becoming sick with this. So I'm advising us all. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Dhikr of Allah is social transactions. I'll discuss it tomorrow. Harvard has done the longest study on what is needed by the societies and they have concluded conclusively that the human race's greatest aspiration is to build social relationships in person to person. So I advise us all, spend time, look at each other, shake hands, smile, hug them, talk to them, say nice things to them, say Alhamdulillah, I'm so happy to see you. Sit down, let's talk and put the phone away. Today it's become very difficult. I'll tell you one final point before I end. The phones, the I, the, the, the I, um, I watches. Now, it's connected to your phone. It's interesting, I have one, I don't use it. Somebody gave it to me, I don't use it. It's very rude. So you're sitting there, a message comes. You're having a meeting. Can you imagine in the olden days, you dare look at the clock. Somebody's in your house, you may look at it from a periphery, but don't look at it. You're telling the person, I'm tired if you get out. You're wasting my time. Akhlaq. The Prophet says, I have been sent to perfect your akhlaq, to perfect your behavior. So this technology is a barakah, but it's also a nemesis. And the balance is what we're talking about. So when you have this phone, you're looking at it. Oh, excuse me, I just have a message. Oh, really? You sure you won't look at the time? It's, it's insulting. Or you put it on silent. In a meeting, you're looking. Uh, sorry. You know how insulting that is? You're talking to somebody, they're looking at the phone. Oh, hold on one second, I, I got something. Now, where do we draw the line to this? Do you think our prophet would do that? Can you imagine if the prophet was in our time and he had a cell phone and you're asking him a question, he says, hold on, I got a text message, I got a reply. Or Imam Mahdi alayhi salam doing that? No. So let's conclude tonight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ When you recite verses, they pay attention, they listen. I advise us all, even these Kindle books, they're great, I have, a, I have them. But nothing beats a real book. Something about that smell, touching the paper, flipping it, is a dimension to that that nothing can compare to it. So I advise us all, get into the real world. Come to facilities, put your phone away, turn it off and say, I'm sorry, for the next two hours, I am out of commission. Thank you. I don't care. Let it go into voicemail. I don't care. Unless it's an emergency, figure it out. But try your best to socially connect the children, especially children. They should be discouraged from having excessive amounts of this technology in their hands because it's going to lead to all kinds of social misbehaviors. And may Allah give us the strength to make them the future leaders of our society, which implies that they need to be vigilant, smart, attentive, and they need to recognize people's names. Who are you? Assalamu alaikum, Hassan. Assalamu alaikum, Zainab. You, when you meet them, you should know how to speak. You should know how to look at them because it has a huge impact on how the world will see us. In summary, brothers and sisters, I'm saying very clearly, Allah has given us material and spiritual. Islam is a religion of balance. Material pursuits and spiritual pursuits are both important. While we fast for spiritual reasons, we must also aspire to become successful individuals, highly educated, and to become leaders of this world, and to understand that all the tools Allah has given us are a blessing, but let us not abuse them with excessive use, through abuse, and especially through neglect. And may Allah give us the tawfiq. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema. Tu'izzu biha al-Islam wa ahla, wa tudhillu biha al-nifaq wa ahla, wa taj'aluna fiha min al-du'ati la ta'atik, والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته